today's world insight. TikTok in big trouble? The likely fate of the Chinese acquired social media app in the face of hostile U.S. policy. And up close and personal with Mark Brzezinski, the son of the legendary diplomat who helped normalize China-U.S. ties. Why have diplomatic missions come under pressure within one generation? What counts in American politics today? Is it expertise? It really, it's more about votes and more about money. That's the American political game. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to ban the popular app TikTok, which has its strong operation in the United States. It is owned by a China-based company. There are now reports that Microsoft wants to buy the app's U.S. business. Microsoft said it would continue to discussions to buy TikTok from Chinese internet giant ByteDance, and it was aiming to conclude the negotiations by September the 15th. Trump also said on Sunday that he will give Microsoft and TikTok 45 days to secure a deal. Zhang Yiming, however, the founder and CEO of Biden, said in an internal company letter on Monday, quote, we have not reached a final solution yet, end of quote. Has China-U.S. competition over cyberspace expanded from Huawei to TikTok? Our panelists give us answers. For more on the TikTok's latest development, we are joined by Max Wolf in New York, managing partner at Melta Variet. And in Shanghai, we have Shen Yi, who is a director of Fudan University Research Center for Cyberspace Governance. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure talking to you. Let me start by reading a little bit from the internal letter put forward by Zhang Yiming the founder and CEO of ByteDance, a parent company of uh, uh, TikTok U.S. In the letter, he expressed the ByteDance's best efforts to comply with U.S. law. He writes, as you may know, in the current environment, we face the real possibility of a forced sale of TikTok U.S. business by CBS or an executive order banning on TikTok app in the U.S. We disagree with CBS conclusion because we have always been committed to user safety, platform neutrality, and transparency. However, we understand their decision in the current microenvironment. Nothing yet has been decided. The possibilities are all open right now. So that's what uh, Jiang Yiming said. So Professor Wolf, given your knowledge of Wall Street and the Silicon Valley, tell me more what this could mean. I do think that people are excited by the prospect of getting this asset. I think ByteDance has built a phenomenon here, and over 105 million Americans seem to be excited about being part of this technology and expressing themselves, indeed building small businesses and large followings, and maybe some businesses that, that really aren't that small off the platform. And the idea that the U.S. government would intervene to force the company to sell it to an American company at a discount will get those companies salivating at the opportunity. Indeed, I think we see Microsoft has already stepped up and I don't think they'll be the last party interested in a hot asset that's appealing to the particularly all important youth market in the US. And mm. very few companies have been able to do what ByteDance's TikTok has done in the US consistently now for, for quite some time. Professor Wolf, of course, uh, geopolitics, uh, this is already a very different uh, stage uh, since we last time talked. Now, is there still rule of business? Is there still any rule of fairness? Is there still going to be any sound business discussion? Or as uh, Mr. Shun explained, uh, very likely it's going to be dominated by geopolitics. I think damaging the international economy has already occurred, but I do think there's hope for cooler heads to prevail. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the ironies of, of a company like Microsoft is they actually plan to do international business and they need to continue to do that business in China. So Microsoft needs China. And even this TikTok purchase they want to do would involve their activity in Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. It just shows you that 
even in this interference with international free trade, the American firm still needs to be able to operate across international borders. Let's take a look at some of these factors, the political factors. The biggest proponent, some say, of banning TikTok has been coming from the State Department, particularly the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. In an interview on Fox recently, he said this. Chinese software companies, he said, doing business in the U.S. are feeding data directly to the Chinese authorities, whether it's TikTok or WeChat. That's what Pompeo said without giving real evidence to back quote unquote, his suspicion. And that has always been the way from Huawei and now to TikTok. These are just the sporadic Chinese companies that are representing a huge pool of Chinese companies that are actually doing business with the United States or other parts of the world. Professor Shen, uh, given an environment like this, some even describe it as toxic. What can Chinese companies do? Or what can Chinese companies who are having various uh, different entities around the world uh, do, including TikTok? Frankly speaking, such kind of question raised by Mr. Pompeo cannot be answered by either single companies, no matter where it comes from, the United States or China or any other countries. Because this is, is not a real business purchase. Mm. It is a highly self-centered, preconception political questions. Let's just say you are guilty. You are evils. You do anything. I have kind of imaginations of your behaviors. You fully obey this law of your behaviors. You do everything according to my imagination. A little bit ridiculous. Frankly speaking, at this time, any companies no matter from any countries, if they counter such kind of problems, one of the very important solutions to solve these questions, a little bit pathetic, is to calling for the help from their own government. Awesome law systems which can correct such kind of misperception hosted by Mr. Pompeo. So it's also maybe for China side, this company must learn to how to ask him for help, for proper help, to providing the necessary assistance so that they can have a fair play environment to doing business. What, what kind of help, uh, Professor Shen, are you specifically referring to? Do you say that uh, these companies calling for the Chinese of, government to get rid of the American companies? Of, uh, is that the, the, the solution the, you are I think, I think the Chinese government needs to do more actively to engage U.S. government to tell them that such kind of imagination is wrong. Because it's a little bit ridiculous. Well, well, well come on, uh, Professor that. Shen, uh, the spokesperson mm -hmm. of the foreign ministry has been talking about this every yeah. day. We also have been hearing from various uh, Chinese government officials about this as well. Meanwhile, you know better probably than I do right now, the channel of communication between Washington and Beijing is not open. Uh, Beijing has been uh, trying very hard to do it. However, it is yeah. not necessarily satisfiable. So when you are saying the Chinese government needs to convey to Washington, to whom? And also whether that's a workable plan no, you no, just no. described. I, I, mean, I mean that well, when we're talking about this, so it's, that's very typical Chinese culture. When I'm talking about that Chinese government intervene, you, your first perception is China government just use their terms to dialogue to persuade their counterparts. So exactly to what are you that saying? I, I, Chinese government needs to take actions. They will not change their terms and their behaviors until they got some lesson. So tit for tat yes. is what Professor Shen would advise to the Chinese government as an intellectual. Now, uh, Professor Wolf, uh, do you think that is the way to do it? Uh, meanwhile, uh, Professor Wolf, the potential of tit for tat, what would that mean for the bilateral uh, economy? Uh, should China and should the United States head that way? Look, it's always better if people can try to reestablish a dialogue, although I understand where you're coming from here. I do think that the folks like Mr. Pompeo and, and Mr. Navarro and, and President Trump are not interested in getting along. They're not interested in a dialogue. They're not interested in a deal. They're interested in a pretty aggressive piece of public theater and because they're making their international policy solely for domestic political consumption, reasonable attempts made by various governments in Europe and Asia and South America 
have not worked very well. And so it is true that people who have pursued the standard diplomatic response, which I think is the smarter course, have largely not been successful because this is not really about China at all. And I think, look, if we had reasonable complaints, and some complaints were reasonable, about data privacy, the smart thing to do is what people do who want the solution, which is say, here's what you need to do, we'll help you do it, you have 120 days to do it, here's where you need to be in 60 days, and you have your regulators work with the company, foreign or domestic, to reach those goals so everyone can be happy. And I think, to be fair, the U.S. hasn't done that because the U.S. is, this regime right now is very interested in painting the Chinese as somehow abusive or showing how tough they are. And in that situation, standard diplomacy fails. I don't know that escalation works, by the way, but I could certainly understand. It'd be hard for me as an American to sit here and tell you, hey, let my government be live in grandstanding and trying to humiliate your government and then just put up with it. That's clearly not appealing, but I don't know that tit for tat works either. Mm. Professor Shen, your response? First, a very the important correction. The Chinese government and the Chinese companies doing a lot to fit for these compliance things. You read the John Yiming's letters, they mentioned when they got requirements from the CFAS about their data privacy, their, their information collections, their standards of digital, uh, the mining data, did, did, did everything in technical ways to fit for these requirements. Mm. But finally, they find out that these requirements are nothing more than an excuse. You did, they say no. You did again, they say no. You delivered them a solution, they say no and no. Mm. Everything you got from them is complaint, is, is a requirement and uh, refuse. That's not a deal. It's no reason for China to accept this deal. Mm. And the second, hit for threat in not means escalations. It's not kind of revenge, it's just kind of response. You punch me, I punch back. Same position, same result. To tell you that such kind of punch will not deliver you any advantages. No revenges, no escalations. It's just kind of choice. From China's side, we deliver negotiations. We prefer dialogue. Okay. No single case that China move first. It's always the United States move first. It's time to change these situations. Interesting. Professor Wolf, of course, I want you to have a response uh, from you, too. My argument is that at this moment, in almost all regards, but certainly in our international trade regards, it is this government's firm position, backed by some serious elites in corporate and elsewhere, that trying to assert dominance and bully Chinese authorities on economic issues is desirable to this government at this time. So I think we agree on that. And I think the Chinese natural response to try to keep the global order afloat by being pretty compromising and by trying to figure out a solution has no doubt been frustratingly unsuccessful to a lot of people, including American business interests um, that want to see better relationships with China. So I do agree it hasn't really worked. My fear is only that if we get more aggressive with each other, it also doesn't solve the problem, right? So I understand what we're doing now doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't solve the problem. And I guess I can't ask China to solve problems about, its, about our government in America that we have failed to solve. On the other hand, I don't know that there is a large return on pushing back. I would say, though, that you definitely don't want to encourage someone to be abusive to you. I understand that. And since being accommodating and diplomatic has not been successful, I'd imagine between the frustration level, it's also hard to continue to do something that doesn't work. Mm. So I'd be sympathetic, but I don't, I don't know that I believe it would be helpful. On the other hand, uh, Professor Shen, some in the U.S. has been asking whether what the, their government is trying to do now is just reciprocal of uh, what Chinese uh, did. Uh, how would you respond to that kind of argument? Do you know from the Chinese side, the dilemma is if we make self-restraint, we obey the rules, we deliver the dialogue. United States, they just push forward, forward, and forward. Ask China to step back, step back. Nothing. You can try. 
you China side can do nothing, and the United States can do everything. When China dialogue with the United States, that's a normal feedback from the U.S. side. So what China can do, just to give up, totally surrender? Even at that situation, the United States always say, your deal is not enough. What about the business circle, um, uh, Professor Wolf? Uh, we all witnessed that interesting moment of the hearing regarding the uh, founders and CEOs of four tech giants, um, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And among them, uh, there are someone who stood out. The CEOs of Facebook and TikTok locked recently horns amid the looming ban on TikTok. Zuckerberg attended an antitrust hearing and affirmed that Facebook stands for a set of basic principles, giving people voice and economic opportunity, keeping people safe, upholding democratic traditions like freedom of expression and voting. That's claimed by the CEO of Facebook. And meanwhile, he has been claiming it's well documented that the Chinese have been stealing uh, either state secrets or some of the important data coming from the American society without giving his evidence either. So the TikTok CEO, Kevin Mayer, hit back and saying these are um, attacks by our competitors, namely Facebook, and disguised as patriotism and designed to put an end to our presence in the U.S. as said by TikTok U.S. CEO. So uh, tell me, um, Professor Wolf, is there going to be a real competition from now on regarding the cyberspace? I mean, this is probably, it's not just the geopolitics. It's the very beginning of a domino effect about how geopolitics will lead the way and overwhelm, overpower the business competition, whether it is in the U.S. market, if it could happen in the U.S. market, it could happen in any market around the world. Professor. Yeah, sure. It's, it's certainly a, a real danger. Look, I think part of what's happened with, uh, with TikTok here, with ByteDance, is actually a bigger problem in the U.S., which is the American public has had a series of rude awakenings, really beginning intensely around the 2006 presidential election and elsewhere, um, and doing some work as I do and as my firm does in data scientists data science, look, I don't think the general public of the United States really understands how their privacy has become a currency, how it's used by companies, including principally the American companies that you mentioned and others, right? And so there's a general late awakening to the realities of modern tech, particularly, you know, mass utilities like Google's and Amazon's and, and, and such that and Facebook that everybody's on. So the public is generally uncomfortable with their privacy and saying that anyone's collecting the privacy freaks them out. It's very easy then for the government to say and foreigners are collecting it and you get a sort of knee-jerk nationalism that says, oh, I don't want a foreigner to collect my data. Although if you ask them, they don't like the American companies doing it either. So I do think privacy and data is gonna be a big issue for states and international organizations to tackle in the next several years. But I think the truth is whenever you see a fading economic power taking on and confront a rising economic power, there's a lot of effort to reassert past ability to write the global rules. I mm. think you see that come to a real kind of philosophy, basically, with this government that we have right now. It's always a growing pain in a funny way, although I'm sure it's cold comfort. The Chinese abuse, some abuse focused on China and the attacks from the U.S. government are the proof that China is a rising power and that we're starting to see some bending of our traditional rules in the U.S. out of fear of that Chinese competitive power. But I think business teaches us that when we can put our fears of each other to rest and figure out how to work together, we live in a more prosperous, more peaceful world. And when we can't, a series of things begin to happen to both parties, which mm. are undesirable. Huawei is still pending, but it's already quite alarming. And now we have a TikTok, which is about KOLs, which is about, you know, dancing and, and jokes and, 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 and user, you know, generated content. Uh, this is becoming more of the same category. That is really mind boggling. Professor Wolf, I'm not 
saying this because you are the representative of U.S. government. I'm just saying this is worrisome looking at the business world for the future. Yeah, I'm probably not much more popular than China with my government, so I don't think I'm a representative. <laughs> I'm not part, <laughs> part of the government. Uh, but uh, that's a, another problem for me to worry about personally. Look, I think American tech companies have the most to lose. So both publicly and privately, my opinion on these matters going all the way back for years now is that American tech companies are all over the world in dominant positions, ca caching and collecting all kinds of data. If we then introduce the world into this idea that foreigners operating large data utilities in your country is a bad idea, no one will lose more than the tech giants you watch testify on stage there because they rely on doing business in 95 countries of which they're, they're only from one. Yeah, so, true. you know, the, the joke, the, the phrase I got famous for, I'll repeat, it's my opinion. If you're one of the top two cards in the deck and you shuffle the deck, you have basically a 50 out of 52 chance of falling in the global order. So aside from the fact that it's immoral, I think some of the things we're doing, it also makes very bad business sense. And I would share some of the folks around the world, some of whom are, are, are admittedly my relatives who are spread out in much different countries. Look, I don't think this is good for America. And I think sadly, big American tech companies may be the biggest loser from all this. And so for their regard, as well as future cooperation, I hope this is a short lived and apologized for pattern of conduct, although I don't think it will be. And I think I don't want to be too optimistic. I don't think it's just the present administration. I think among parts of the general public and the political elite more broadly in the U.S., blaming foreigners as it has been throughout history when governments have done a poor job has become quite bipartisan and quite fashionable. Professor Shen, before we go, I want to have a same question, but in a different way to you. China and United States all together representing about 40% of the global GDP. Well, China and the U.S. are having this, whatever you call geopolitical tit for tat or political election, or whatever politics going on. The 60% of the rest of the world are watching. They try to figure out who to work with and who not. Uh, who is still upholding the rule and who is throwing it away? So, Professor Shen, before we go, what do you think, from your perspective, the mid and long term, and the sake of working with others, not just the United States, the right attitude from China about this TikTok and probably about more Chinese tech companies? The Beijing has made a very clear choice. Even though faced this unilateral action from the United States, Beijing tried to take a very cooperative and responsible attitude, not only to deal with these bilateral relationships, but to take the global as a shared destiny communities. From China's side, I want to, I, you, you can find that Chinese government did everything, every sincere step to prove its willingness of cooperation and coordination. And on the other side, even you say that both China and the United States represent about the 40% of the global GDP of 20%, but this China side not only fo focusing on the United States, we always look on the global. Aid. We want to take a very responsible behaviors, not only to the Sino-US relationships, but to the global communities. Chinese government to make a very clear self restraint and a very responsible step to deal with all these things and want to deal with all these things in multilateral realism framework to dialogue, to solve, to obey this rule of laws and try to play the games by the uh, responsible uh, continuity and uh, how to say the persistence the the the, the continues uh, Chinese government I think China has already do its best you're watching world insights still to come up on our program I speak to Mark Brzezinski son of a diplomat who helped normalize China US ties why have diplomatic missions come under pressure within one generation Hello and welcome back. You're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Now let's continue our special series, Pathfinder, stories of people who witnessed the history that had a profound impact on the China-U.S. ties. 
They say like father, like son. That ancient wisdom at least could apply to this father and this son duel. Zbigniew Brzezinski, the father, and Mark Brzezinski, the son. The father was counselor to the Lyndon Johnson administration and national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter. He was instrumental in laying the foundation to the budding China-U.S. relationship. The son, Mark Brzezinski, former U.S. ambassador to Sweden, inherited his father's fascination about the world, and he is most keen on the fate of China-U.S. ties. Earlier, I spoke to Ambassador Brzezinski. Our conversation began at the Diao Yuta guest house, the very same guest house that hosted his father during those important visits to China many years ago. On China-U.S. relations, he went straight to the point. Diao Yutai State Guest House, that's where your father once wore. Yes. I'm sure you heard a lot from him, the stories decades ago about U.S. and China. I did. I'm sure those stories will be even more meaningful today. Well, it's so great that you start this interview that way because for the last couple of days, I really felt I was channeling my late father because he believed so much in the Sino-U.S. relationship as having the potential to address some of the world's great challenges of today mm -hmm. and tomorrow. He really felt that this is the most important relationship America has with the world. If he were still alive today, what he would be doing is he would be on American television using his credibility and his legitimacy as a statesman, as someone who had produced for the American people in foreign policy, he would be explaining to the American people mm. how, how the Sino-U.S. relationship benefits them, and he would be coming to China to meet with the Chinese leadership and to say, it takes two to tango. Mm. Both sides have to constructively engage each other. Both sides bring good aspects and things that need to be improved. Do we still have statesmen like this? That's an excellent question. The American political context has changed since the time of the Cold War. During the Cold War, who led American foreign policy? Mm. Kissinger, Brzezinski, Scowcroft, mm. Albright, people who were true foreign policy scholars and who had steeped their knowledge in foreign policy from the very beginning to the very end. Right. They weren't part-time foreign policy guys who join a presidential administration because they'd help the president campaign. These were America's and the world's best experts on the foreign policy challenges America mm. faced around the world. Mm. Since the Cold War, the primacy of expertise in American foreign policy has been replaced by other priorities right. in the American political game. What counts in American politics today? Is it expertise? It really, it's more about votes and more about money. That's the American political game. And as a result, you get what you ask for. Yeah. When you elect a president today, there's a lot of political people, not foreign policy specialists, but political people who want jobs in government. The foreign policy jobs are very attractive. They want the foreign policy jobs, yes. but they don't bring the expertise. As a result of that, how do you see the potential between China and the United States. The real picture is much bigger than that. Well, let's talk about both sides because I think that's an important point. Mm. First of all, let's not minimize the trade differences. The trade differences are important for a key constituency, a key beneficiary of this relationship, mm -hmm. the business community in both countries and also in other countries. Don't forget about that. Right. And all of them want this to be solved and all of them want America and China to operate within a rules-based system. And I'm actually confident that this will be resolved because I believe that, that the Chinese have been clear that they understand that there are some problems that need to be fixed. And I think that that's a very constructive way to mm -hmm. engage. My worry is a little bit more about the American side. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a demographic of policy people, security people, military people, political people who for decades have been hoping to break the catalyst of the American-Chinese relationship, and their time has come. They have been empowered by the current moment, 
And if President Trump left office today, they wouldn't leave. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't want to give up the ground that they fought for. And so I'm worried. What does it take to break this almost predictable trend, as you just said, that even though the administration could go on, but some of the quote-unquote legacies of the administration and the hardliners against China and against the potential of relationship to begin with are still going to be in the system. Sure. Well, there are also beneficiaries of the relationship. The American business community clearly benefits from a constructive, normalized Sino-U.S. relationship. When I was the United States ambassador in Sweden, Sweet, the Swedish government undertook an effort that was very interesting. They pulled together a document that was very digestible, very understandable for the American people, mm -hmm. that analyzed state by state by state how many American jobs and in what sectors are based in that particular state on, on Swedish investment in, mm -hmm. say, Virginia or Pennsylvania or New York or whatever, all 50 states. And they shared those the, the, that with the business people in that state, the state governors who want to attract overseas investment, who then distributed it right. and so forth and so on. That's the kind of knowledge dissemination that needs to occur about the American-Chinese relationship. Mm. Um, and then there's the Chinese side. Um, the, the, my father and President Xi had a very good, close personal relationship. Mm -hmm. And when my father died, President Xi wrote my mother a personally very meaningful letter that she received. And we treasure that and we thank President Xi mm. for that. We very much uh, respect the fact that he's been part and a central piece of the American-Chinese relationship. It is important to accentuate in Chinese policymaking that the success of both sides is part of the relationship. Mm. Because there are some in China who see China's long-term rise. There are some in China who see America's long-term decline. And there are some who actually celebrate that. That's no way to have a constructive relationship. If I want you to fail, we're not going to have a friendship. If I want you to succeed, it's more likely we'll have a friendship. Mm. So how do you read, given the current realities in both countries, about the eagerness to develop better relations? Well, I think that's based on self-interest. Um, and I think that it's, it, it will become clear mm. as that self-interest is harmed by a breakdown of the relationship that those who are losing the benefits of the relationship will speak out. You mean we have to hurt more in order to know the real nature of the well, issue? Well, I, I hope it doesn't come to that. But probably that's something we have to face. I think that we don't want the relationship to break down. If the relationship is based on preventing failure, it's not as strong as a relationship on mutual success. Mm. But it's important for the Americans to understand that China's success is a great story for the world's humanity. And that's something that I really want to emphasize. You know, the way people in one country mm. perceive another country is not based on a study of data and statistics and, and facts. Mm. For regular people, that's not how they develop a, their perception of, say, China or Sweden or Germany. It's based on human interest stories. That's right. It's based on narratives. And the narrative of China over the last 40 years, going from a country that I visited in 1981, think about that, Chengdu, for example, which only had dirt roads and used army vehicles on the streets, to the tech city of the future that mm. Chengdu now. That is a great rags to riches story that I think Americans would mm. really respect and embrace because it's quite frankly universal and to the American narrative as well. Ambassador Brzezinski, you grew up in a family in which Big matters seem to be, can be discussed around the dinner table. It's true. <laughs> Very true. I just wonder, what was it like to be in a family of the Brzezinskis? It was the privilege of a lifetime because we were just my brother, my sister, yes. uh, and I. And my sister is one of America's most popular television talk show sure. hosts. And I think she would share this with you. When we were seven, eight, nine years old, 
my father at the dinner table or lunch table would be asking us about detente, salt <laughs> too, the Middle East peace process, <laughs> U.S.-China relations. Quite an appetizer. Yes, exa exactly. Uh, I'm surprised we didn't run away from home. <laughs> but the point. How did you manage to do that? <laughs> exactly. But the point is, is that my father, as a Washington leader, included his family in his life and that was a great gift because not every Washington leader includes their family in their life. So just as stupid kids, we were brought to dinners with Deng Xiaoping and mm. Mrs. Deng. Do you still remember anything about it? I, I absolutely, you were very, very young. I absolutely remember it. Tell me more and about it, that. It was very human. What do I mean by that? A dinner in your home being put on by the premier of China. Your street is closed off by the Secret Service. There are helicopters overhead, <laughs> shining lights. The Secret Service says, two minutes out, Deng Xiaoping, Mrs. Deng are arriving in a long motorcade with police cars. And what happens in our house? My parents light the fireplace, and the smoke comes pouring out because they hadn't opened the flue. <laughs> and so you know this story. They had to shut off that room right. and hold the meeting with Deng Xiaoping in the front hallway. And that's a, I want to emphasize that. Mm. Because in families, not everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. And you gotta just... Usually a lot of things are not perfect. Exactly. <laughs> and so you just deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what we did was that we had that meeting there. My sister spilled caviar on Deng Xiaoping. Um, and, um, but he included us. Uh, and, and he included us in things around the world. I mean, my, my sister traveled with my father to the Middle East and met Yasser Arafat. Mm. I traveled with my father throughout Europe and to Asia. Mm. Uh, all of us came to retrace um, Mao Zedong's long march. But you know, for the common folks these days, yeah. when the media is pretty much portraying things from one perspective or not, what is the way for common people you know, to be more sophisticated about what they're seeing? The great Czech author wrote, for every language you know, another life you live. And I think that's true. Americans and Chinese should learn foreign languages. Because by learning foreign languages, you absorb consciously and subconsciously right. what's going on with them. And I go back to my late father, who spoke five languages, and until his dying days, would translate from Russian or Polish or French mm. from newspapers so that he would have a feel for what is going on in Europe mm. or in Russia. He did, he, and, and that's important because it goes back to your initial question about foreign policy expertise. Right. Because if you're uninformed, if you're told black is white, you'll believe it because that's what you've been told. And foreign policy professionals need to be that professional. And that is learned about this and not just going on gut. Mm. Um, and so sending out a tweet saying who is a bigger enemy, President Xi or the, the head of the Fed, Jay Powell, I don't consider to be professional. Um, I think that that's destructive and insulting and um, I don't like it. Before we go, Ambassador Brzezinski, you're coming from a very well-known family. Yes. Your father fought his way to be where he was absolutely through his personal fight in a way and efforts. What, what kinds of you know, inspiration you get from your family? Well, at the same time, what kind of individual life you need to have of your own apart or in addition to the family tradition? No, my father was not born into money or power. He was cast on America's by shores by World War II, mm -hmm. so was an immigrant to America through Canada, and many people don't know this, but he had polio when he was little, mm. and so wore leg braces when he was very young. So was he uh, one of the chosen ones to take leadership? No, he wasn't. You said it. He had to fight for it, and he faced setbacks mm. in his life. And there were times in my life when he shared stories that were meant to educate me. Mm -hmm. um, when I've had disappointments in my life, he said to me, Mark, learn from me. Make this a disappointment, not a defeat. Hmm. And he shared with me the story that when he was a professor at Harvard, the most popular professor, giving lectures that would have audiences clap for him standing, 
he was then denied tenure when he and my mother expected to stay in Boston mm -hmm. as an academic family for the rest of their life. But instead they said, I'm not going to make a defeat which brings me down and keeps me mm -hmm. down, but a disappointment that I learn from and grow from. And he went to New York, but set his sights on Washington. And he said, how do I use Columbia University in New York, but also relationships in Wall Street to get to Washington? And he built a relationship with David Rockefeller, mm -hmm. and he and David Rockefeller set up the Trilateral Commission, which became the most influential organization in international affairs. And he invited then Governor Carter to join the organization, and the rest is history. He was a Polish immigrant to America, mm. standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviets. That is what I learned. Mm. And so I know exactly what you're asking. There are good points, and there are some difficult points. But the good outweighs the different because of things like that. Mr. Ambassador, what a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is mine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, the son of uh, Brezhnev Brzezinski, talking about China-U.S. history. And this is part of our Pathfinder series of interviews with witnesses to history. If you'd like to see more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. And